you through the emulation activities that we do for SOCs and at standalone level. So welcome, Gaurav, and uh, the floor is all yours now. Okay. Thanks, Akhil. Uh, so let me uh, share my screen. Uh, is it visible? Are the slides visible? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, uh, uh, hello everyone. Good evening. Uh, uh, and thanks, Akhil, for the introduction. Uh, uh, I welcome all of you to uh, to this uh, SOC emulation session organized by NXP as part of its Campus Connect uh, uh, program. And I hope uh, you know uh, all of you uh, get benefited with this uh, session. Okay. Uh, so uh, just a brief introduction about myself. My name is uh, Gaurav and I'm currently working as a senior emulation manager in NXP. Uh, I'm part of the central MCU MPU uh, R&D organization, which is catering to uh, multiple uh, business lines such as uh, automotive uh, and within automotive, sales radar, vision, etc. cetera. Uh, I'm with uh, NXP. Uh, since 2008, uh, so almost around 13 years uh, here. OK, uh, coming to the agenda, uh, so uh, I'll just briefly touch upon, you know, uh, uh, what is NXP? What are the different market areas or, uh, you know, segments where, you know, NXP works? Uh, then we'll touch upon our, our subject uh, for today, which is emulation. You know, we'll, and as part of it, we'll figure out uh, what is emulation, how is it different from simulation or verification uh, uh, via, via software simulation, why is it needed, uh, what are the bare minimum requirements or prerequisites for performing emulation at the SOC level, what is the overall, uh, you know, emulation flow? Uh, how it fits uh, within the within the SOC design flow, right? Uh, what are the typical use cases or uh, sweet spots for emulation? And uh, then eventually, you know, uh, we'll cover who who all can are the different consumers of uh, of the emulation platform and what all what all are the areas that that are covered on the on the emulation. And finally, we'll, we'll, we'll come to uh, you know uh, the area like like what it is uh, it for us, uh, you know, and what is required to be uh, you know emulation engineers or prototyping engineers. OK. Uh, so quickly, I think uh, uh, many of you must be knowing uh, NXP uh, uh, is a number one global automotive supplier uh, with more than 30 sites uh, across the world. Uh, there are more than uh, you know 2,400 plus engineers who are working in, within the uh, you know automotive segment, uh, and uh, almost around roughly 40% of revenue is coming from the automotive group. A uh, lot of experience. Uh, you know, uh, more than 60 years of experience in the automotive domain, domain uh, 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 in NXP. So you can imagine, you know, what kind of uh, uh, you know expertise and innovation that is there in this team. Uh, in addition to autom automotive, uh, there are other. Uh, these are the other target areas or market segments where NXP operates. Uh, there, uh, there is industrial and IoT. Uh, IoT is basically Internet of Things. So a lot of edge processing and uh, you know edge processing devices. Uh, a lot of electronics uh, getting added into that. Uh, uh, then there is also a mobile segment. Uh, uh, if you guys have heard of you know there is recent uh, uh, announcement related to. NXP being uh, partnering with uh, geo platforms, the Reliance uh, geo platforms for 5G broadband access rollout. Uh, and also, I think uh, in the back end communication infrastructure. So these are the major you know, market segments where NXP is uh, operating and uh, uh, 
in most of these segments, you know, there's a major market share which NXP has. OK, so this is this was just a brief uh, introduction about NXP uh, coming to our, uh, our subject for today, which is uh, emulation, right? Uh, so I think first first of all, uh, the question is what is uh, emulation and uh, how is it different from simulation? So as you all know, uh, you know, uh, in 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 uh, in the overall SOC design flow, uh, the SOC design uh, or IP design is followed up by by various IP integration or SOC integration activities, and those are followed up with the functional verification of the of the IPs or in the SOC context uh, when those IPs are integrated together. So uh, so that functional verification or integration verification ensures that uh, you know the design or the SOC is uh, meeting uh, the specifications. So in the overall uh, you know SOC design flow functional simulation Functional verification is a very critical part uh, of the overall SOC design flow and uh, within the functional uh, verification, there are multiple techniques through which uh, we, we verify the design. Simulation is one part of it uh, and uh, emulation is another technique through which uh, uh, we do functional verification. Uh, so, so when we come to simulation, it is basically uh, done uh, on CPU based uh, machines uh, which execute the simulator uh, algorithm uh, in a serial manner, uh, you know, uh, mimicking the circuit behavior uh, with respect to the stimulus or the vectors that we are providing. Uh, whereas emulation is, is uh, uh, a technique through which an RTL is mapped in which our design or RTL is mapped, uh, you know, on another piece of hardware, which is uh, typically a, a specialized emulation system. And uh, because uh, there are multiple hardware components such as arrays of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, multiple processors or cores which are working in parallel. So thereby uh, the overall simulation is accelerated due to due to the parallel or simultaneous uh, tasks which are uh, which are uh, executing the the simulation. OK, so. So what is an emulation system and um, it's it's basically any emulator is is a combination of a, uh, of hardware and software uh, to mimic uh, or map our design and RTL and uh, you know verify it in a uh, in a uh, with uh, real time uh, target systems. Uh, it is reprogrammable, so that means you know any uh, any design or any RTL which is which is mapped uh, to that emulator. Uh, you can uh, you can download the bit file or the image of that RTL or the compiled database and then uh, uh, you know you can uh, 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 remove that bit file and uh, uh, you know reload another uh, design uh, compiled database so so it is fully reprogrammable and uh, there is also a capability to uh, give test vectors uh, and stimulate the design uh, and check with the expected output to to overall verify the design okay so Emulation gives us an additional capability of accelerating the simulations. Typical scenarios which are not able, which we are not able to reproduce or which we are not able to run in simulation because of the slow nature of simulation. Uh, so those uh, simulations are targeted in an emulation system. And thus, uh, before any tape out, it is a must, uh, uh, a must to do step to ensure uh, and gain confidence on our SOC before it is taped out. OK. Uh, so why do we need emulation? So I think uh, as we discussed, uh, it helps in speeding up or accelerating the, the simulation. And thus we can run uh, various scenarios which are not possible to run in, sim, in, sim, in the software based simulation. 
because of the slow uh, slowness uh, uh, that is there will will be covering uh, you know that the, those details in the coming slides however i think uh, the major need is that uh, uh, we need to test our device or test our SOS system on chip, uh, uh, you know, in with real target systems uh, before tape out, you know, before the silicon arrives. So it helps in catching all the different functional bugs which are missed in simulation. Uh, we can attach uh, an actual debugger uh, with the emulator. So there are common uh, debuggers like Lauterbach or uh, you know ARM DS5 uh, through which typically all the application engineers or the software engineers you know debug their software. So it is very important uh, part of the design to uh, have that capability and verify it uh, uh, before uh, we freeze the design. Uh, then hardware software co-verification, any uh, software or firmware or embedded firmware such as Bootrom, uh, which is part of the SOC. Uh, so it is uh, it is difficult to run the complete software or the embedded firmware, uh, uh, you know, in simulation as it needs a lot of uh, cycles to be run and thus uh, you know any hardware software interaction or uh, you know to check whether the hardware and software are compatible or not we need to uh, enable the hardware software co verification uh, in the emulation platform uh, another other types of use other types of use cases for emulation are performance analysis uh, you know whether the design uh, is able to meet uh, the required bandwidth, uh, the data bandwidth and the latency uh, in a real in a real world traffic scenario. Uh, so that that kind of analysis is, is pretty important and can be done in emulation. Uh, uh, there is also another use case uh, which is typically used is we have these post silicon validation teams. Uh, they typically, uh, you know, develop their test cases or, uh, you know, startup ports uh, on the emulator so that they are uh, ready once the silicon arrives after after the tape out and uh, they are ready to uh, excite the, the silicon and test it, uh, thus saving a lot of time, uh, you know, and, and the content of the test suite can be ready before uh, the silicon arrives. Okay, so these are some of the you know uh, typical uh, uses uh, why we need uh, emulation. Uh, they are these are this is not the complete list, but just to give an idea uh, about uh, what are the areas where emulation is required. Uh, then coming to the popular approaches for pre-silicon validation. So pre-silicon validation is another term which is used, uh, uh, you know, for it's an umbrella term for uh, emulation as well as prototyping. So uh, as as you see from the term pre silicon means anything which is uh, which is done before the tape out before uh, the silicon arrival and on a broad basis we basically have two categories inside uh, the pre silicon validation. One is uh, emulation which is typically uh, done using the common hardware emulators provided by uh, the EDA vendors. So the common hardware emulators are Palladium provided by Cadence, uh, Zebu uh, is provided by Synopsys and then we also have Veloce which is provided by Mentor Graphics uh, now uh, known as Siemens acquired by Siemens uh, right and uh, then uh, we also have prototyping which is basically uh, to map the design onto uh, you know, uh, 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 market av available FPGAs such as from Xilinx, etc. Uh, so, for example, you know, Xilinx, Vertex 7, etc. All these are type are, are uh, market enable uh, available in the market uh, for general use uh, and can be used for FPGA prototyping. We'll come to the differences between these in the in the coming slides. Okay. So again, just to uh, just to highlight, uh, 
you know and uh, rehydrate why we need to emulate uh, it is up to 10 to the power 5 or 100000 times faster than simulation uh, we can use this uh, environment to target our soc or design uh, with a target system uh, when 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 i say a target system it basically means uh, you know the uh, in a in a kind of a board setup where uh, the actual silicon will be used uh, uh, with actual uh, you know uh, uh, exercisers or testers uh, that can be connected to the emulator uh, to generate a real world uh, traffic scenario typically in simulation we are using uh, bus functional models or uh, you know uh, simple models to generate traffic uh, which does not uh, mimic the real world uh, traffic so emulation is useful for doing that uh, we discussed uh, system level uh, you know functional problems and as well as the concurrent development of uh, hardware software and systems so i think as i was mentioning uh, you know post silicon teams uh, use it uh, to shift left their content development or test suite development similarly the software and the application folks use the emulator for uh, you know uh, early start of their software development uh, as well as the, the software uh, can be used uh, along with hardware to ensure that there are no uh, you know compatibility issues uh, between the between them so overall you know uh, it it is helping in you know shift left of the overall soc development cycle okay so again coming back to the use cases uh, one of the uh, use case for emulation is uh, your functional verification of the hardware right uh, uh, it includes both the stress scenarios performance verification such as bandwidth and latency uh, uh, verification it includes hardware software co verification etc uh, then validation code development uh, for for by the post silicon teams to uh, shift left their uh, you know get prepared for the uh, for the silicon testing application and software development uh, uh, used by the app, by the different uh, software engineers and application engineers for early software development and uh, similarly for uh, you know debug uh, debugger softwares like we have application software we have uh, debugger softwares which helps uh, the application engineers or the software engineers to help debug their software on the on the silicon or on the emulators does that kind of software development uh, that that software development can be uh, done on this emulator okay uh, so uh, just to give you a brief idea about the different uh, uh, you know emulators that we have so this picture on the right uh, bottom which you are seeing is it's an example it's a it's a, a pig of a palladium uh, emulator uh, pxp uh, which is provided by cadence and uh, it supports uh, you know uh, multiple users uh, can be connected to the to the, to the different uh, the host machines which are connected to the emulator right uh, it it's we, we represent uh, we map or we compile the rtl uh, of our soc or the design uh, you know to the to the to this emulator to mimic an actual uh, replica uh, which is equivalent to uh, silicon except uh, for some of the areas which uh, I will cover in terms of limitations of uh, you know this overall emulation process. Uh, so this is just a, a, you know give, to give an idea about this Palladium emulator, and uh, I think uh, all these use cases we have discussed. Uh, so uh, on this point, it is slower than FPG. Uh, so basically the FPGA prototyping uh, uh, is, uh, is 
is faster than the emulation because uh, it, uh, so typically the range for uh, uh, FPGA prototypes, they are typically running at 10 to 20 megahertz frequency, whereas uh, these emulation platforms uh, are, uh, you know, they can run at 1 megahertz to 2 megahertz range. However, there are certain uh, pros and cons for both uh, in terms of uh, emulation versus prototyping. Uh, so I'll come to that uh, slightly later. So uh, again, coming to uh, this is example of an another uh, emulator which is provided by Synopsys known as Zebu. So this is a, a ZS3 uh, emulator which is having these you know, uh, five uh, cards uh, within a box. So this is one. This is one box, and within this uh, these box, uh, we have five cards, and each card can uh, support up to six. Up can can uh, map 60 million gates. So overall, one uh, ZS3 box uh, can be used to map uh, a design up to 300 million gates capacity, and uh, we can. Uh, connect uh, different uh, ZS3 boxes together uh, uh, through a backplane uh, in order to uh, you know map even bigger designs uh, if required. Okay, so uh, so as as we as we saw you know each card is of 60 million gates so overall five cards so 300 million gate capacity overall. Uh, up to five users can be can work on this box uh, simultaneously, which basically means if we have a design which can map to one card, then we we can have five simultaneous users working on on this box uh, concurrently on that design. So which gives a uh, you know data center kind of a uh, operation just like uh, what we have for simulation. OK, it can be expanded up to 3 billion gates uh, capacity. Uh, maximum number of users that it can support is 49. Uh, all the emulators are connected basically to a, a host uh, machine, which is known as host PC through high bandwidth uh, PCI link. Uh, so there is a PCI card which uh, basically is used for transferring the, the data from the emulator to the to the host machine. So for example, you know all the waveform data uh, or log files, etc., which are uh, generated from the uh, simulation on the emulator. So that data is transferred to the host machine via this high bandwidth PCI link. OK, and this basically uh, then stores all the emulation results and uh, uh, this host PC is used to control the emulation uh, control the emulator as well. OK, uh, so all the you know real world interfaces like uh, Ethernet, uh, USB, uh, other high speed protocols like DDR, uh, you know uh, other memory cards such as SD, MMC, all these uh, all these interfaces uh, can be can be uh, enabled on these emulator platforms uh, through uh, uh, so there are there are basically two popular mechanisms to do that. One is via uh, uh, using an actual, for example, if we take a, an example of Ethernet, we can connect an actual Ethernet exerciser or a or a tester uh, to the emulator uh, via a, a bridge uh, hardware, which is known as a speed bridge, uh, to generate an actual Ethernet uh, data traffic from the tester into the DUT. Another way is uh, more like simulation with more closer to the simulation where we have uh, Ethernet bus functional model, uh, you know, BFM. And on top of that, we have uh, we have a software layer through which we can inject uh, Ethernet packets into the DUT. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll cover more details uh, in the coming slides, but uh, just for now, I think you can remember that they are basically uh, couple of mechanisms through which we can inject traffic because in order to uh, verify the design and the and the software we need the capability uh, similar to a test bench uh, in the simulation world right uh, 
then uh, as i mentioned it is uh, these emulators are fully configurable portable uh, we can quickly move from design a to design b uh, once we have the compiled databases ready for these uh, particular emulator uh, all these emulators typically support the unified flow which basically means uh, you know the front end compile or the or the first compilation process uh, is is through the simulator itself like in case of uh, synopsis zebu zs3 this can be done through vcs uh, for the debug uh, it is typically integrated with, integrated with birdie so all these uh, you know gives a unified uh, flow uh, uh, for for the emulation platform uh, users and uh, also i think if they if someone is working in simulation then it becomes easier for that person to also use this emulation platform uh, uh, considering some of the tools are uh, tooling uh, is same right uh, so uh, again it is emphasizing on the shift left uh, strategy for software development uh, as well as uh, identifying uh, uh, you know and uh, correcting any bugs in the design which uh, uh, which cannot be caught in simulation because of uh, actual uh, real world traffic uh, you know not available or because of the uh, long simulation time which is required to uh, caught that kind of a of a bug okay uh okay so now coming to the uh, different uh, emulation use models and uh, what are the different modes uh, in which we can use the emulator and what are their performances uh, typically all the different emulators which i mentioned whether it is palladium from cadence uh, zebu from synopsis or or veloce Uh, from mentor uh, all of these uh, typically all these emulators support all these modes right uh, uh, so coming uh, so, so starting with simulation which is basically our software simulation uh, which we are doing through uh, the software based uh, simulators like vcs or uh, excelium or iron uh, so they are typically running in the uh, uh, you know uh, Uh, in the in the hertz range like maximum uh, simulation will be running at 100 hertz or 120 hertz right this is this by this frequency i mean uh, uh, the simulation speed not the actual uh, the hardware speed or the design speed right uh, and that is why uh, we need uh, emulation to uh, accelerate uh, this process as you can see You know our simulator is running at a at a pretty lower speed, which is in the hertz, uh, 100 to 150 hertz range. Then uh, once we move to emulator, uh, we have uh, we have uh, one mechanism which was used earlier. It is not being used now nowadays because of the uh, lower uh, speed, uh, uh, which was basically signal based acceleration. Uh, so in this in this mode. our rtl uh, or the dot is mapped on the emulator and the test bench uh, is is uh, test bench runs on the host machine uh, which is if you remember uh, there is a there is a host pc which is connected via via a high bandwidth pci link uh, to the emulator and which is used to control the emulator as well as run uh, the test bench part uh, but as you can see you know uh, this uh, uh communication between the host pc and the emulator is happening at every signal level at every uh, clock cycle and thus uh, the overall uh, acceleration uh, becomes very limited because of this continuous interaction between the emulator and the host pc uh, and thus the the performance uh, in terms of acceleration is pretty low which is around uh, 5 kilohertz range uh, this mechanism is not Uh, in uh, not in popular practice uh, 
okay then coming back to coming to a next version uh, next mode which is transaction based acceleration which is uh, which is heavily uh, which is heavily used uh, uh, in in emulation so here basically uh, what we have is we have uh, our test bench divided into two parts one is uh, for example if we have a, a a simulation a driver basically a ethernet driver for example so there we'll have a synthesizable bus functional model which will be uh, emulated uh, which will be mapped on the emulator and uh, we have a software uh, a layer on top of that bus functional model which will be running on the host machine and thus uh, uh, the communication between the synthesizable bfm and the and the software layer which running on the host machine is at the at a transaction level and not at signal level so basically you can you can see a transaction as an for example a uh, uh, you know 100 packets uh, of uh, say any protocol say 100 frames of uh, uh, ethernet uh, l3 frames uh, uh, can be clubbed into one transaction and uh, you know uh, just uh, sent together in in one go so uh, because of this transaction based communication the uh, the communication between the host pc and the emulator is uh, is greatly reduced and therefore the simulation x like the acceleration speed or the, the acceleration achieved is much higher than than the signal based uh, acceleration Okay, typically uh, this is even though this diagram is showing it in around 100 kilohertz range, but typically we with with better modeling we have seen it uh, seen this to be around uh, you know <clears throat> going above going around 1 megahertz uh, to 1.5 megahertz as well. <coughs> And the latest uh, you know uh, uh, emulators such as uh, Uh, ZS4 uh, from Synopsys. It can go even higher than 1.5 megahertz. Another popular, uh, you know, and then coming to the other extreme, you know, another popular mode uh, is uh, in circuit emulation, also known as ICE, ICE uh, mode. Uh, in this mode, uh, we actually connect the emulator with a with a real world uh, hardware hardware, for example, such as a Ethernet. exerciser or a tester uh, through a through a uh, bridge uh, hardware which is again provided by the edga vendor okay so i'll come i'll share uh, some of the uh, you know pros and cons of both these uh, modes uh, uh, slightly later right <coughs> okay so uh, coming to the Uh, different use models. So, as I was discussing, this uh, this is ICE mode, uh, which is the in-circuit emulation. Uh, so, we, here we have our design or SOC RTL mapped on the emulator. So, this is the emulator, and uh, these are basically uh, uh, hardware, uh, real-world uh, hardware, which is basically Ethernet tester. Uh, these are the Ethernet testers, and these are connected to the Uh, to the emulator via via speed adapters or ethernet speed bridge as we call it uh, why this uh, speed bridge or uh, speed adapter is needed because this is a real hardware which is uh, running at a very high frequency whereas our design in the emulator is running at say 1 megahertz uh, or 1.5 megahertz thus uh, in order for these to to interact or communicate we need to basically map the speed requirements of the emulator so that uh, this uh, tester can uh, communicate with uh, with the emulated design on the emulator uh, correctly so this is basically a, a you know which, which is which is called as in circuit emulation mode or ice mode this is the the fastest available mode uh, in emulation and uh, you know most uh, 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 robust in terms of testing however uh, you know one of the disadvantage of this uh, kind of in uh, environment is uh, you you need to have these uh, you know physical hardware like ethernet testers in your emulation lab 
and in case you know there is any uh, so first thing is it is more expensive because you need to have uh, you know those many testers available uh, as the number of users uh, needs to work in parallel so if we have limited uh, you know testers then obviously number of users will be less second thing is if there is any issue in the setup uh, because of certain uh, you know over the time you know some some loose wiring or some loose cabling uh, happens then someone needs to physically check the overall setup going to the emulation lab and uh, and uh, check the setup manually so again that is a uh, tedious and time consuming process uh, so this is second uh, reason uh, second disadvantage third disadvantage is sometimes it is it is not possible to reproduce a failure uh, in this setup because you know our uh, you know the way the tester is operating and and the and uh, how a particular sequence of event is generated uh, it may not be uh, the same actual sequence of events that that may generate the next time you run so thus the reproducibility of the failure is was a challenge uh, in this kind of in this mode which is ice mode okay so uh, these are some of the advantages and disadvantages of the in circuit emulation mode coming to the uh, uh, to the next model uh, next use model which is transaction based acceleration uh, also known as uh, TBA or some people also known as call as call it as TBX. Uh, uh, this was this is the uh, most popular uh, emulation mod mode which is currently being used uh, and uh, here basically we do not have a have an actual uh, you know hardware based tester uh, but what we have is uh, here is the emulator where we have uh, uh, the emulated design mapped onto this emulator right within this we have a ethernet uh, controller for example uh, and uh, there is a, a, a phi uh, model which is a synthesizable model and and a synthesizable bfm uh, uh, ethernet bfm which is uh, used to drive uh, the uh, the DOT pins at the signal level. Okay, Sim this is similar to like what we have a simulation driver, but only difference is that both these all these components are synthesizable. Only synthesizable components can be mapped on the emulator. Any non-synthesizable test bench component uh, will be running on the host host side. So this is the BFM, which uh, which basically drives the design at the signal level, and then there is a software layer on top of that. Uh, uh, you know this BFM, which is running on the host machine. Uh, now what this software layer does is it will basically create a transaction of n number of Ethernet packets or frames, and uh, it will send it to the to the transactor in one go. Does this uh, uh, you know this software layer which is running on this host piece host PC uh, which is connected via a co-modeling link uh, via the PCI uh, high bandwidth PCI link. Uh, so this communication will be done only at the transaction level and thus uh, the communi the the interaction between these two will be minimized and thus will get a uh, therefore will get a higher uh, higher uh, performance with respect to uh, you know, signal based acceleration, but it will be lower than ice. OK, so 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 one of the disadvantage of this setup is uh, with respect to ice mode is the performance will be lower because there is still certain communication happening between uh, the host PC machine as and the emulator. But uh, on the advantage or on the uh, you know, the pros of this methodology is uh, you can uh, you can generate any number of uh, you know sequences uh, similar to the simulation world uh, and uh, it is fully reproducible that is you if if a failure is observed in design in a particular run you can completely reproduce uh, fully reproduce that particular sequence of events uh, uh, on the emulated design and uh, reproduce the failure uh, 
uh, in uh, with this with 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 the help of these uh, you know with this transaction based acceleration model typically uh, we call these uh, you know the software layer and the synthesizable bfm has uh, accelerated vips or uh, you know transactors so this is the terminology used by different eda vendors but uh, it's a, it's a concept similar to the simulation vips uh, and uh, in emulation world uh, it is they are known as accelerated vips as uh, uh, you know we have the synthesizable bfm part and a software layer on top of it or uh, we also call them as transactors uh, in the emulation terminology okay so uh, these are the two uh, you know major use models uh, on in in emulation and uh, you know uh, uh, some of the advantages and disadvantages uh, in both the uh, for both the models. So, thus, what is your target application and uh, what kind of target uh, design target you want to verify? Based on that, uh, we can select any of the approaches. Okay. Uh, so, uh, changing uh, gears slightly. Uh, I'll come. Uh, I'll now, uh, you know, come to basic uh, emulation fundamentals like what is required uh, uh, to map our design on an emulator. So, if you have a SOC RTL or a, a design RTL, uh, what is the requirements for that for that RTL to be mapped, right? So, first of all, I think the basic uh, first basic requirement is it has to be synthesizable. Any non-synthesizable construct, uh, you know, such as forever, or uh, even you know uh, uh, the primitives like trans and mos, pmos, these needs to be remodeled, uh, correct? You, you know, uh, into a synthesizable uh, port. Then only you can map the design onto the uh, emulator because it is uh, a silicon uh, in itself, right? Uh, user defined primitives are allowed however uh, you know uh, a basic synthesizable uh, behavioral model description is preferable uh, to be mapped onto the rtl right uh, uh, all the memories which are part of the design such as you know uh, system memories or uh, any other uh, subsystem level memories uh, so typically in in simulation we have a behavioral model that is used uh, in simulation however that is not synthesizable thus we would be needing a synthesizable view for all the different memories which are part of our design right and uh, if uh, the design or or soc rtl also have some analog components for example Typically, we have these blocking uh, IPs like PLLs, IRCs, oscillators. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we can we may have these ADCs uh, and lock to digital converters, uh, uh, etc. So, all these components needs to be modeled uh, uh, before we can map before we can map them on the emulator, right? Uh, so either we need to have a synthesizable representation, a uh, basic representation of their basic functionality modeled in a synthesizable manner for the analog component, or we need to probably just have a stub for that model. By stub, uh, I mean uh, just the IOs uh, defined uh, of that particular module and uh, the outputs are uh, driven to safe values or uh, you know, uh, active low values. Uh, uh, okay, so coming to the blocking, uh, all the different, uh, you know, analog clock sources such as PLLs, IRCs, oscillators, they uh, needs to be defined in the in the test bench, right? Because we cannot model uh, the analog, uh, you know, analog nature of these circuits. Uh, we need to be uh, we need to define all the primary clocks by primary clocks. I mean all the uh, all the uh, clocks such as IRCs, oscillators, PLS uh, that are being used in the design. And uh, we also need to take care of the any 
dependency between uh, you know if there are secondary clocks which are generated from the primary clocks okay uh, all these clocks are defined from all the primary clocks are defined uh, within the emulation model uh, uh, along with their frequencies and uh, all these clocks are driven from time zero in the simulation and uh, they are continuously running clocks we uh, they, these clocks uh, do not uh, stop okay uh, ios uh, there may be a pull up uh, or pull down requirement on certain of the on, on specific ios based on the protocol requirements so that can be mapped that can be uh, you know modeled in the in the synthesizable uh, wrapper over the DOT. Uh, any uh, hard ties, uh, tie, tie zero, tie one needs to be taken care. Uh, there may be typically uh, at the SOC level, we have multiple uh, IPs or functionalities which are merged uh, uh, onto the same pins or same pads at the at the chip top level. Uh, and thus uh, we may need to create uh, similar demuxing logic uh, to uh, enable you know multiple drivers on the same set of pads uh, based on you know which functionality will be active uh, at particular point of time okay uh, uh, Obviously, uh, as emulator is uh, it's a hardware, so there is no concept of uh, Z or X uh, in simulation like, as in simulation, right? It's a two state uh, and every emulator is uh, two state. So high Z is implemented as uh, uh, high or low, which is configurable. You can you can specify, you know, how that uh, high impedance state can be modeled. Uh, but eventually it will be either zero or one uh, it will be two state only there is no uh, concept of x or z in emulation okay so uh, coming uh, to the next set of uh, requirements uh, there may be uh, you know uh, external memories which are connected to the design for example you know uh, DDRs, uh, we can have flash models, uh, we can have uh, memory cards such as SD or MMCs, uh, you know, NAND flashes, NOR flashes, all these type of different external memories. So, uh, so in order to model these, we need their respective synthesizable views. Typically, uh, these uh, memory synthesizable views are provided by the EDA vendors uh, based on requirement. Uh, so, so, so typically a design as 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 a design house, we don't need to uh, you know create uh, uh, these synthesizable uh, views. Okay. Also, uh, you know, I, uh, for 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 driver part, either we have to use uh, you know uh, our accelerated VIP or transactor, or we need to ensure that the complete driver is synthesizable if we need to map it to the hardware. Okay, um, any custom glue requirement uh, that again uh, needs to be modeled uh, if it is outside the DOT and pull up, pull down uh, again as similar to IOS. If there is any requirement for uh, memory interfaces, then that needs to be modeled in the in the synthesizable test bench. Uh, these are uh, some of the speed bridges uh, which are again provided by EDA vendors. For example, the the pit uh, the picture on the top right, uh, which you see, is a, a multi-speed Ethernet bridge, uh, which is basically uh, used to connect the Ethernet uh, exerciser or the tester to the emulator. Uh, similarly, uh, for debugger, uh, any physical debugger like Lauterbach. Uh, you know, you need to have a speed bridge or uh, or uh, accelerated VIP or transactor, which is mimicking the JTAG protocol. Uh, OK, so for any uh, debugger connectivity or uh, specific pattern generator, you need these uh, speed bridges, uh, you know, uh, uh, in addition to the emulator for mimicking these uh, interfaces and communicating with real world uh, traffic. 
Okay, uh, so uh, once you have met, uh, okay, so now coming uh, uh, to uh, the next set of uh, requirements for emulation. So once we have our RTL ready, uh, uh, which uh, by you know basically uh, it has all the synthesizability requirements uh, met, then once we are able to map it on on the emulator. Then we need to be aware of you know uh, the basic uh, uh, boot up sequence of the device, right? Basic reset sequencing of the device in order to uh, ensure that the design is working correctly on the emulator. And uh, so, so, so here, for example, you know we have this uh, uh, this clock running, which is one of the primary clocks defined earlier in one of the slides which we saw. And then we have typically a power on reset, uh, which is asserted after a few cycles. Uh, typically, this power on reset is modeled, uh, uh, you know, in the in the emulation test bench as uh, this is typically coming from the power management controller block, which is analog in nature. Uh, then once this power power on reset is uh, is lifted, uh, then we have the digital. Uh, Corresponding digital reset uh, signal lifted up on the next stage, and, and eventually, you know, our system uh, reset is lifted uh, after the after the power on reset. So this is a uh, a simplest uh, simplistic view of uh, overall boot sequence of or the reset sequence of any SOC. Typically, these are much more complex and a lot of operations happening during the reset sequencing. So. Uh, in order to ensure that our design is working correctly uh, and design is coming out of reset on the emulator, we need to be uh, we need to be uh, completely aware of the reset sequencing of the design so that we can uh, debug our design and ensure it is coming out of reset and uh, you know code execution can uh, is happening correctly on <clears throat> any of the cores which is part of our SOC design or RTL. OK, so, so overall the boot up sequence and the reset sequence uh, is a must for any uh, emulation person or engineer to enable the design on emulator. OK, uh, then coming to the uh, right set of expectations from emulation model, uh, you know, uh, uh, it is it is very important that we uh, have right set of expectations. Uh, because uh, there are certain limitations to emulation uh, and it cannot cover everything, right? Uh, as we saw, <clears throat> we typically uh, cannot run analog uh, simulations or anything which involves, you know, analog modules uh, as typically we either stub them out or replace them with a very basic representation, synthesizable representation. So it is only for uh, you know, functional validation of digital blocks. Uh, uh, in simulation, we have a concept of timing annotated uh, simulations, uh, also known as gate level simulations, but we do not have any timing uh, or delay concept, SDF concept in, in, in the emulator, in either of the emulators. Uh, speed bridges uh, or the required hardware to connect to a real world tester. It is available for specific protocols, not all the protocols or not all the proprietary protocols may have that feature, uh, that that piece of hardware available. Uh, it is slower than FPGA prototyping. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, prototyping uh, runs in the range of 10 to 20 megahertz, whereas, uh, you know, uh, uh, this uh, emulation is running at uh, say 1 megahertz to 2 megahertz range. Uh, but it is still, uh, you know, uh, uh, faster than much faster, 10 to about five times faster than simulation. Uh, then on the clocking side, uh, there is typically in every emulator we have a we have a master clock, uh, uh, which is the fastest emulator clock based on the. Uh, once you compile your design, uh, then there is a certain performance frequency which is reported that okay, you can run your uh, emulated design at uh, one megahertz or 1.5 megahertz. So based on that, there is a 
there is a fastest uh, emulator clock also known as master clock and all the other uh, clocks of the design are uh, actually derived uh, from that master clock so uh, eventually you know all these clocks since they are derived out of one master clock so all these clocks are synchronous so uh, so uh, async uh, mapping or async clock uh, uh, clocking functionalities are limited uh, on the emulator all the clocks are relative for example you know uh, you may have a 1 gigahertz uh, pll clock in your design however it will be mapped uh, to a slower clock based on the emulated uh, model frequency and uh, all the clock ratios will be preserved for example if there is a 1 gigahertz clock in the design and there is a 500 megahertz clock in the design then the ratio between these two clocks will be 1 by 2 on the emulator. However, the frequency or the, the, the time period of these clocks and the emulation waveforms may not be corresponding to 1 gigahertz or 500 megahertz as we typically see in simulation. So all clocks are relative, meaning that all their ratios will be maintained. Uh, however, the absolute frequency is of no significance. Uh, we can apply triggers or uh, you know certain uh, okay so this point is also very important that debugging uh, you know one of the uh, limitation in the emulation with respect to simulation is the the debug visibility is uh, debug visibility is uh, slightly compromised with respect to simulation because it is faster, but you cannot dump the waveforms of say uh, billions of cycles or millions of cycles of data. So you need to specify a certain window uh, in the simulation, which uh, is the you know identified area of interest for the waveforms to debug any issue. And thus, uh, you know, if you are not able to identify the uh, the the waveform window uh, which in which the error occurs, then it may take a uh, few iterations for for anyone who is debugging uh, his design on the emulator. OK, uh, then uh, obviously it comes to our mind then that you know when, when we have these many features available, why can't we just replace uh, uh, emulation? Uh, why do we do simulation? You know, why don't we do just uh, emulation, but definitely I think it is not a replacement of functional uh, simulation. It is a uh, it is an augmentation technique uh, uh, to cover those scenarios which cannot be covered in simulation and gain additional coverage. Uh, uh, you know, with respect to uh, in addition to what we can get in simulation. OK. So uh, so uh, OK, so now we are uh, done with uh, uh, the, the prerequisites of uh, you know what needs to be done in the RTL to map it to the emulator, uh, you know, and uh, some of the basic clocking techniques are uh, some of the debug uh, related uh, limitations. So now coming to the emulation flow. Uh, so typically, uh, <coughs> uh, you know, first we uh, uh, in, in simulation we compile our RTL and uh, you know uh, then run that compiled database on that software based simulator. Uh, however, uh, in the emulation flow, first we uh, do the synthesis of the design and the test bench. Uh, by test bench, only the synthesizable part of the test bench is uh, is synthesized. The non synthesizable components uh, will be run on the host PC. Uh, then after the synthesis, we do a compilation which basically uh, creates a compiled database or a bit file uh, that can be mapped onto the emulator. Right. Uh, uh, and then we uh, we run uh, that uh, compiled database uh, on the emulator. Uh, uh, which is basically uh, uh, to ensure that uh, the, the generated model is working correctly and we are able to bring the model out of reset uh, and uh, run the applications on 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 the model. So uh, typically, uh, you know, there are two uh, 
mechanisms mechanisms through which we debug any failures on the emulator first is via uh, debuggers uh, via uh, debuggers uh, jtag based debuggers right through which we can uh, look into the internal design registers via uh, uh, via these debuggers and figure out you know if there is any uh, issue in the design uh, and another uh, way is also uh, is the traditional way through which uh, typically the simulation folks uh, debug is via using uh, waveforms so you can specify you know certain window uh, uh, by a, by certain triggers uh, and then generate the waveforms for say 5 million cycles or 10 million cycles and uh, then you can view the waveforms and design activity uh, similarly to uh, what we do in simulation right uh, and some of the you know typical use cases uh, you know for example if uh, uh, i'm i'm generate i'm uh, working on a on a radar uh, soc or a vision processing soc or uh, say uh, RT, a machine learning based uh, soc so there i need to you know uh, run full uh, for example if it's a vision soc i need to run full HD side size images, multiple images, uh, or in case of radar, I need to uh, ensure that I'm I'm running all the samples which are coming from the from the radio uh, antenna. Uh, so typically, you know, these uh, this much amount of data is it is not possible to run in simulation, uh, and thus these are the typical examples where emulation is needed so that we can run the full size images or full radar data or you know other software algorithms for a machine learning based soc or you know typical uh, typical uh, similar associated softwares uh, which cannot be run in simulation so these are uh, run in uh, you know emulation similarly performance you know uh, performance uh, is critical when you are running uh, long simulations with actual software running so their uh, performance uh, analysis become very important and thus that is another area where uh, hardware acceleration is is typically required just uh, okay coming to the uh, coming to the uh, typical pre uh, emulation infrastructure uh, so here as you see we have uh, uh, SOC RTL, uh, which is mapped to the emulator, and there is a wrapper on top of that, uh, along with some of the synthesizable uh, components, synthesizable test bench components, and then we have these uh, synthesizable uh, bus functional models. If these are synthesizable, then they will be part of uh, the emulator itself, and on top of that, we have different, you know. Uh, software layers for example if you want to send in any image uh, from the camera then you can generate that image and send it over the MIPI uh, BFM which is the tip which is a uh, uh, you know standard protocol uh, for any video data uh, similarly for uh, displaying to the external world we have this MIPI DSI protocol so you can basically see you know typical environment of uh, any pre-silicon uh, uh, emulation test bench. There can be a speed bridge to connect to the external peripheral. Uh, there can be another, uh, you know, small uh, ASIC. Typically in a, in a system of systems, we have multiple uh, chips uh, interacting with each other on, a, on the board. So even that kind of communication, it is possible to uh, run in emulator. Uh, which is not feasible in simulation because of the slow speed. OK. <clears throat> so coming to, you know, uh, what are the requirements for emulation prototyping engineers? You know, uh, what what they need to do, uh, what they need to understand. You know, we typically all these all, all emulation or prototyping engineers, we need to understand the overall uh, SOC and the design architecture and how uh, you know that system works, what are the uh, 
typical data paths uh, what are the use cases what are what is the end application of that uh, design or soc uh, we need to understand the front end design part how the rtl uh, is generated what are the synthesizable components non synthesizable components how to model the the required components which are non synthesizable into a simple synthesizable uh, manner you know uh, uh, some of the back end skills place and route techniques are also required uh, especially for prototype engineers if you are mapping your design design on a on a commercial uh, you know uh, fpga such as from xilinx uh, then uh, the placement how how we are partitioning the design how uh, the placement and route needs to work even those skills are required in emulation that is uh, not that uh, that much required because it is all taken by the amp it is all taken care by the emulation software itself so so you don't need to be a back end expert or a pnr expert if you are doing emulation as that is taken care by the software itself okay software development some of the software related know how should be there uh, board design skills uh, if you are doing prototyping or you know multiple socs are involved and obviously you know uh, you need to have a verification mindset or a validation mindset and uh, capability to debug inside the design either via waveforms or by debugger so you need to have good uh, rtl know how or soc know how as well uh, so that uh, in case of any failures you can debug and you can reproduce that issue and uh, debug the root basically what is causing the failure in the design okay uh, coming to the prototype uh, fpga prototyping i think it is very important that uh, we have a clear goal on why we want to create a soc prototype because overall effort in fpga prototyping is very high because of manual uh, you know partitioning of the design manual place and route uh, timing closer etc uh, there are there are certain clocking requirements to it as well uh, so thus it is very important that uh, why we want to create uh, fpga prototype or why we want to do emulation you know what are the eventual uh, platform users whether there are uh, certain software teams who will be using this platform for uh, you know device driver development or other application development or you know any embedded firmware like boot like boot firmware similarly uh, you know what are the other use cases that needs to be run uh, uh, whether we need to do it on commercial side of fpgas or you know whether the emulation app, uh, platforms is is a better approach so all the all these uh, you know options needs to be considered before we actually decide on on this as the investment uh, the hardware uh, cost as well as the investment in mapping the design onto these uh, hardware so there is a significant effort in the setup uh, thus it needs to be carefully chosen you know uh, what kind of uh, uh, hardware uh, acceleration uh, we want to do or what kind of pre-silicon validation setup uh, is required okay uh, so then on the uh, this picture it basically depicts you know uh, summarize our overall discussion uh, if you see here uh, this is a traditional uh, uh, soc development cycle uh, we have this architecture defined by the systems and chip architects. Uh, then we have this RTL development uh, with uh, functional verification simulation going. A backend team does the synthesis, routing, PNR, timing, closer, and finally we have this, uh, you know, manufacturing and silicon prototype available. And then, uh, you know, traditionally we have the software teams coming into picture uh, at this point of time when the silicon is available then they used to start their software development and uh, hardware software core development uh, but now with this uh, emulation platform available in the early stage right uh, 
and this platform gives the software guys the the in, enough speed uh, to develop their uh, firmware or applications or device drivers so they can basically uh, shift left and start while the hardware is still in development obviously uh, uh, it takes some time for the hardware also to get matured a bit so uh, there will be some uh, compatibility issues uh, that will be observed in the start but slowly as the rtl matures uh, it becomes uh, a good platform for the overall software development as well as uh, your hardware is getting uh, you know co-verified with the software so that is another important thing uh, uh, which will uh, you know you can see a surprise if if that is done after the silicon is available so overall uh, if you see uh, there is a significant uh, time to market and uh, typically these days you know uh, just hardware is not enough for any any customer uh, they need both hardware and software to use that uh, as a as a overall solution so uh, so overall you know if we have this software available right here then we can do a co testing and, and this is the overall time to market game Uh, this is a typical, you know, uh, FPGA prototyping, uh, uh, you know, flowchart. Uh, typically, we have this SOC design, uh, and then, <clears throat> you know, we have a, a RTL source which is mapped onto the FPGA, and then we bring up the design and execute our uh, testing or simulations. And in any, in in case, you know, there is any failure which. Uh, we are not able to debug on this uh, on this FPGA hardware. Then we can map the same RTL source on the emulation and and debug here with respect to uh, with waveforms or better visibility in the design. So so the debug visibility is much better in the emulator than than in the FPGA prototypes kind of setup. Okay, so. So I think that's all from my side. Uh, uh, I hope uh, uh, I'm able to give uh, a overview and basic requirements uh, and you know subtle differences between the different uh, approaches, use models. Uh, and uh, I'm open for any questions. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Hello. Yeah, uh, please go ahead. I have a question like uh, we have FPGA also and we have emulsion. So as you told, it is more easy to debug in the emulsion environment as compared to the uh, FPGA environment. There is other benefit uh, including the debug or there is some other uh, uh, feature that are there in the emulsion as compared to the FPGA. Right, so <clears throat> I think uh, uh, why we do FPGA prototyping is because of the uh, higher speed. So typically, you know, if you are mapping your design <clears throat> on any commercial uh, FPGA like uh, Xilinx, uh, then you, you can typically get speeds of up to 10 megahertz to 20 megahertz, which is basically your simulation speed, right? Uh, but uh, the disadvantage is uh, that uh, in case of any failure, uh, the debug visibility is lower because uh, you don't have that kind of waveform capability on on a FPGA prototype, right? So only ways through connect through external debugger or or uh, you know uh, basically uh, uh, look into some of the design internals. But if we are not able to uh, figure the design issue uh, or setup issue by it with that, then uh, you know we need to go back to the emulation platform, and uh, there we have much more better visibility in terms of uh, you know uh, you can look into the waveforms, uh, you can specify different windows, uh, and multiple iterations can be done quickly. So, okay. so those are the advantages for the emulation platform. Um, in at, that at case, if, yes, yes. In that case, if we have to debug more, so we can use 
that kit of the FPGA into the emulsion or we need to transfer the code only? Uh, we need to trans. We need to basically use the same RDL code, uh, same RDL source to create a, a bit file for uh, you know emulator. And uh, in some cases now, uh, you know, uh, uh, some of the FPGA prototypes coming from the EDA vendors, uh, they they claim that uh, the same bit file can be used uh, in the FPGA prototype as well. Uh, uh, so, uh, but typically, you know, there will be some differences in the RTL modeling between FPGA prototypes and, and the emulated designs. So, uh, so uh, there will be some differences, uh, but we just need to, uh, uh, we just need the, the bit file or the compiled database. We don't need anything else. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hello, hi, Gauru. Hi. I have a question. Thank you. This sir. It was the informative. Am I audible? So FPGA emulation can be used to uh, shall be used to uh, test the use case based scenarios, right? So yeah. uh, in that case, uh, we will be using some uh, uh, complex C test case, right? So to generate the test vectors and all. So we need to check for the uh, modules which are ideal. And we need to have a power control right? so in the C test case. So in that case, how effectively we can uh, check the, the power uh, power ports basically, and uh, so whether the module is in uh, off or on, and whether the outputs of the ports uh, which are all getting uh, from the off module, whether it should not be uh, disturbed, right? So that thing, how we can effectively verify the FPG. Right, so. Uh, so first I'll uh, let me cover this for on the emulation platform. So some of all the emulation platforms, these uh, typically, you know, uh, all the low power controller uh, or the power management controllers uh, you need to mimic uh, via some basic uh, state machines which are synthesizable so that all the different controls can be, you know, modeled uh, inside uh, the emulator. Uh, all, all these emulators also support, you know, uh, low power uh, simulations and uh, UPF or CPF can also be given as an input uh, uh, to uh, basically, uh, you know, in case of a switched off domain, they will basically scramble the output uh, of the switched off domain and see if there is any uh, uh, you know any any side effect of uh, or because of incorrect isolation value in the in the powered up domain. So those kind of uh, uh, mechanisms are available in the on the emulation side. Uh, on the FPG, I think uh, uh, typically you will you will basically need to write all the different sequences like going from one power domain into another power domain uh, and uh, you know switching basically uh, switching into different uh, low power modes of the design uh, uh, and then basically uh, check whether your application is running correctly or not. Okay. Uh, but is there any, any specific uh, mechanism which you want to know in FPGA prototype for the low power? Here, for example, in the FPGA emulation, uh, so have the scenario where the display port has to be on. I mean, that is around the rest of the hardware can be uh, made, made into like a deep power the mode. So in that case, uh, so it, it has to check for the uh, X propagation as well. And uh, it has to check for the uh, voltage, voltage level for the deep power mode. So everything it has to do so that we can uh, do the power analysis as well. Right? So for the user uh, test case based scenarios. So how we are uh, doing this effectively? Uh, so I'm not exactly sure on the FPGA uh, prototype, uh, but I'm, I can tell you on the emulator we have this, uh, you know, capability to generate the design activity uh, in in a VCD format or a, a CEF format or any other proprietary format 
uh, which can be uh, you know given to any uh, uh, power tool uh, to determine the uh, mm -hmm. dynamic uh, power mm -hmm. average and the peak power so that mm -hmm. is uh, available on the emulation uh, side on the fpga prototype i am not sure but i'm 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 assuming there might be some some uh, similar uh, mechanism available to uh, dump the design activity So for the FPGA emulation, do we have any uh, uh, the low power based transactors, something like that, or for the power control? Uh, I'm not aware of any specific, uh, any, any standard uh, transactor uh, from the vendors. I think typically it is proprietary uh, for different uh, proprietary code for different companies. So typically that needs to be modeled you know, uh, uh, by by the person who is uh, doing the FPG prototyping or bringing up the model. Okay. And Gaurav to add further to Shiva's, uh, Shiva to add to what Gaurav okay. said, uh, okay. in UPF uh, or CPF, you will have these power state tables and level shifters introduced and there will be static and dynamic checks. So in case your voltage levels are not shifting, those checks will be asserted and you'll come to know that power switching from one power rail to another are not happening correctly. Yeah. So those kind of UPF and CPF checks will be there. OK. Those yeah. are supported on emulator. OK. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Me. Yeah. Thanks. thanks. Me. Yeah. Hello, sir. Yeah. Sir, uh, sir, you told one term that is machine learning based SOC. Can you explain more on it? Right. So, so I think there there are certain uh, uh, you know high performance uh, uh, compute uh, requirements. Uh, they basically you know any machine learning algorithm uh, typically uh, needs to have. Uh, uh, an accelerator which can basically do uh, mathematical operations in parallel, right? Typically, like matrix, uh, matrix operations. Uh, you know, uh, there, there are there's a lot of mathematics uh, and matrix uh, operations involved in in these uh, machine learning algorithms, and uh, in order to uh, uh, do these operations fast fast enough, so that you know if if there's certain uh, decision or inferencing being uh, being that needs to be done based on the data set, uh, you know we need a high performance, uh, high compute uh, accelerator, accelerator which can do these uh, uh, you know computations in parallel. Typically, you know these uh, typically the cores which we have they are not uh, suited enough to uh, run, do so many computations in parallel and thus we have specific set of uh, accelerators like D DSPs or uh, you know uh, AI uh, ML accelerators which have uh, this uh, these uh, multiple uh, small array of processor cores which can uh, mimic uh, uh, different mathematical operations in parallel. So, so, so these SOCs, you know, typically have these kind of accelerators. Uh, it needs uh, high speed uh, storage uh, system so that data can be picked up quickly and stored in memory uh, very, very fast. Uh, so, so have special kind of, you know, memory uh, interfaces uh, with uh, low latency, with low latencies. So, so these are the set of, you know, uh, SOCs. These are typical uh, characteristics of you know these kind of SOCs, uh, which are targeting machine learning or AI-based applications. Thank you. But, uh, yeah. Hi, Gaurav. Uh, yeah. I have a question regarding this uh, emulators. Um, for example, if we have a, a test case in simulation, we can run the same test case in the emulator uh, because we here in the description I see test bench has to be realizable and that can be that can take the vectors or the inputs uh, from the simulation. Meaning, 
So can we run the test case which is running in simulation? We can run it in the uh, emulators. Uh, yeah, typically, uh, you know, uh, if you have uh, in the simulation environment, if you have C based, uh, if you have a, a C and system Verilog based uh, simulation test bench, right? And you have certain mm -hmm. uh, C code running on 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 the on the course. So, uh, so that uh, C part of the code uh, can be leveraged uh, directly uh, and can be rerun on the emulator, provided uh, you know if there is any handshake happening with, between with the Verilog or the system Verilog test bench, then that handshake uh, needs to be modeled correctly uh, because there is. Uh, uh, if we are not using uh, you know a simulation uh, acceleration kind of mode where we are having the complete test bench uh, running on the host right uh, so then that's a kind that c part of the test case can be reused uh, uh, typically uh, the simulation vips will be replaced by uh, accelerated vips or or transactors uh, which may have uh, uh, which may have a C interface for the software layer, or it all we can also use UVM based interface, which is on top of the C layer. So based uh, depends on the you know uh, uh, the kind of accelerated VIP or transactors. If, if I have a UVM, uh, yeah. So, so if I have a UVM test bench uh, and. We will be able to port it into this simulator, uh, AVM test bench, which is, right. for example, uses a Synapsis VIP, and then the corresponding uh, UVM sequences could be executable on this, as it is. Right. So you need to, uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so as per my, uh, uh, and, and, you know, experience, we need to make certain uh, changes to our test bench to make it, uh, you know, emulation friendly. Uh, okay. Obviously, we will not want to uh, be having very frequent interaction between the test bench and the and the emulator uh, because test bench will be modeled onto the on the host PC. So more interaction will slow slow down uh, the overall uh, you know simulation. Uh, so so we need to model certain parts of our test bench. Uh, you know make it certain parts of a test bench needs to be synthesizable. And then uh, there's certain scoreboards or monitors, etc., that cannot be made synthesizable. They need to be uh, run on the on the host uh, machine. So uh, there would be some effort required to make the simulation test bench emulation friendly before it can be mimicked. Uh, before it can be run on the emulator. Yeah. Typically, does I mean do we also consider functional coverage via the emulator? Uh, I think that's a good question. I think uh, for coverage, uh, typically what we are doing is we are uh, we are merging the coverage which is generated on emulation along with simulation and formal coverage, uh, so that we can you know get a uh, overall uh, coverage from the different uh, platforms. Typically, there's uh, you know in terms of uh, specifically coverage uh, on the emulation platform. Uh, we don't target say 100% functional coverage or 100% code coverage uh, specifically on the on the emulator because there are certain specific uh, stress scenarios use case scenarios which are which are targeted on on emulator and not uh, the target is not to you know excite every every uh, port or every uh, every piece of functionality so uh, so typically you know uh, i think uh, uh, if we are generating coverage on emulation platform, it will be more useful if we can merge it with simulation and formal coverage. Yeah, Hi, I have a question. Yeah. Hi. Uh, you said that uh, we cannot model high impedance on emulator, right? Uh, it will model it as zero and one only. Yeah. Uh, so how can we uh, emulate? Uh, suppose we have a tri-state buffer. Because if enable of a tri-state buffer is zero, then the output is high impedance. So can we emulate tri-state buffer on emulator or not? Uh, typically, these kind of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, logics will be need. They need to be replaced 
with the simple uh, behavioral logic or uh, it will be mapped to either 0 or 1. There is no concept of uh, X or Z in emulator. And if we have an X, then also it will be 0 and mapped as 0 and 1, right? Yeah, it, it will be either 0 or 1. So how can we solve this problem? Well, uh, uh, see if you have a silicon, right? If any any uh, silicon, uh, you cannot have a X, right? Either the output of a your flop is either zero or one based on the voltage uh, level or metastability. Uh, if even if it is metastable, it, it will pick up one value, right? And for that uh, uncertain value, we have a concept of X. But uh, actually in silicon or in hardware, there is no there is no X. It, it is either zero or one. So so it is not a it's a property of the hardware or the silicon, right? Uh, 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 typically, for example, you know, for modeling X, they can be scrambling that can be used, which basically means you can randomly uh, uh, randomly, you know, uh, toggle the outputs, uh, which is typically used in low power simulations if, uh, on emulator. So that that technique can be used. Scrambling can be used, but in general, uh, I think this is uh, how the silicon behaves. And for high impedance, what modeling technique can we use? Same, same, same thing. OK. Uh, Kill you are on mute. Okay, sorry about uh, that. Yeah, we, uh, I think we are pretty much out of so time. Sorry, Akhil. Uh, uh, sorry, Akhil. Uh, one point I just wanted to add to Gaurav's uh, comment yeah. to Akshat that tri state buffers will be supported, Akshat, but like Gaurav said, in real hardware, in real device, you'll either have a 0 or 1, and that's why X to Z would be replaced with 0 or 1, where you have a configuration available where you can justify or specify whether you want it to be replaced with zero or you want it to be high. But it will never be X or Z. But tri-state will work that enable will drive your original input value and otherwise you will be driving that instead of X or Z a specific value that you must have specified before synthesis. OK, thank you. OK, I think we are uh, pretty much out of time today. Uh, thanks Gaurav for the for the nice presentation. I hope all the participants uh, gained valuable insight into emulation. Uh, the recordings would be available on YouTube channel as before. Uh, so in case uh, you want to review it at your own leisure, please feel free to do so. And uh, if there are any questions, send us uh, to them over LinkedIn and uh, we should be more than happy to reply to them. Thanks a lot, Gaurav, and uh, to all our uh, participants, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, talk to you soon in the next couple of weeks. Thanks. Bye. Okay, bye, everyone.